Thanks everyone for coming, um, particularly in the run-up to the exam season. This is a fantastic turnout and it's a testament to Toby. On behalf of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk, we're delighted to invite Toby Orr to speak to us today. Introducing Toby is something of an exercise in humility, in that, well, to say that he's accomplished more at this stage of his career than most people do in a lifetime is something of an understatement. On the one hand, there's his academics. He's made important contributions to a range of fields, including theoretical and practical ethics, population ethics, the impacts of future technology, and high impact, low probability risks. He has a background in both computer science and analytic philosophy, which means that he's been an important contributor to the recent discussions over the long-term impacts of artificial intelligence. But he's also been very focused on taking his research and applying it to important real-world problems and policy. So he is an advisor to the World Health Organization uh, on health economics. He's been providing guidance to the UK government in various ways. He was the co-author of a chapter on existential risk for the Chief Scientific Advisor's annual report last year, and a co-author of a report on unprecedented technological risks that went to the cabinet last year. He uh, has also contributed to the methodology of the National Risk Register. But perhaps his biggest contribution has been in philanthropy, in 2009, he launched an organization called Giving What We Can. Can I just get a sense, how many Giving What We Can members are in the audience today? A whole lot of you. So uh, <laughs> that says something. So Giving What We Can is now an international community of people who are focused on giving away 10% or more of their lifetime earnings to the most effective charities, whatever they may be, as um, decided by the evidence. Toby himself gives away considerably more than that. Based on their website today, Giving What We Can is on the threshold of hitting $400 million in lifetime pledges, which is a remarkable accomplishment in just five years, and is growing faster than ever. And it's a central part of um, the effective altruism movement. Now this is a very broad range of things, but what brings it all together is Toby's underlying focus on the big picture questions, the global priorities that deserve the most of our attention going forward. Now one of these is existential risk, and it's been an intellectual pillar of Toby's work for the last couple of years, and what he'll be speaking to us about today. Today he'll talk to us about why it might be our own actions and the fruits of our own progress as a civilization that present the greatest threat to us um, and to our future potential. And that this, therefore, is the challenge that most deserves our attention and our actions. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, so uh, the uh, title of this talk, uh, Will We Cause Our Own Extinction? Uh, I will attempt to answer that question. Uh, it, it won't just be a dodge, uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not entirely sure, and it will depend on, uh, for example, when our extinction happens. Um, and in particular, what I'll be trying to look at is whether it will be caused, uh, more likely to be caused, by anthropogenic extinction risks, so uh, man-made, you know, causing our own extinction, or by natural uh, extinction risks. Uh, and trying to compare the relative likelihoods of these different categories. So human extinction, uh, somewhat needless to say, uh, is one of the worst things uh, that could possibly happen. Um, but surprisingly, given that it is one of the worst things that could possibly happen, uh, it has very little serious academic study. Uh, there, are, there is a reasonable amount of study on some particular extinction risks. Uh, very little study across the board, though. Uh, a colleague of mine at uh, the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, uh, Nick Bostrom, uh, looked into this a bit and found that uh, there are more papers published on uh, dung beetles uh, than there are on human extinction. Uh, and in fact, just in case you think, well, dung beetles are a very important uh, part of uh, biology and maybe there's just, there's, there's more papers, academic papers published on Star Trek than on human extinction. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so something's a bit funny there. Um, and there's actually a lot of things that you could say about human extinction. 
Uh, it's not all that likely. Uh, a lot of the things that we study are things that are at least somewhat likely to happen in the next few years, maybe the next couple of election cycles or uh, something like that. Uh, it's not that likely we'll go extinct in the next uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, but it would be useful if uh, people could put some uh, bounds or at least some, some good estimates as to what the chance of uh, human extinction would be uh, over the next century, say. Uh, so I think thinking about the likelihood of extinction risks is, is one category of research that would be useful to have more of. Uh, another is uh, trying to identify and uh, categorize possible causes of extinction and trying to find out more about each of those causes. Uh, for example, more about uh, uh, asteroids and comet impacts or more about uh, nuclear war. Um, uh, and also trying to uh, think about the best preventative measures. Uh, this talk will be mainly on likelihood. And I can also, I'm happy to report that, uh, that this is changing. Uh, there, you know, with uh, CSER being set up here, at, uh, here in Cambridge, uh, the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, uh, the Future of Life Institute uh, at MIT, uh, and uh, uh, the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute, um, and also just a, a range of uh, recent papers and books that have been coming out on this. Uh, it's very much though, uh, a lot of the research has happened over the last 10 years or so, and is really just getting started. Uh, so, uh, what I want to do is to compare the relative likelihoods of uh, natural uh, extinction uh, versus anthropogenic extinction. Uh, I'm focusing on extinction via a catastrophic event. Uh, extinction doesn't have to mean that. It could be the slow dwindling of the population, perhaps because we're, you know, a species is being outcompeted by another species and slowly moves to extinction uh, or uh, something like that. Uh, but I'm going to be, uh, some of the arguments I'm saying will actually capture all cause extinction. Um, but my main focus is on catastrophic extinction, and I'm thinking about this uh, over the next few centuries. Um, uh, we'll get to that right at the end, uh, the limitations of that. Um, as it happens, uh, if I'm asking the question, will we cause our own extinction, and I think it's, rel it's not that likely that we'll go extinct in the next few centuries, then maybe my argument about whether, which one's more likely in the next few centuries is somewhat moot, uh, if there are going to be many more centuries to come, and if that's when it was going to happen. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, and I'm going to measure it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of comparisons of different risks here. And the unit I'll use is the percentage chance of extinction per century. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, yes, argue that anthropogenic risks are more likely. Um, so let's start uh, with the natural risks. So these uh, have, yes, the most solid evidence of extinction risk. Uh, the Potential extinction from anthropogenic risks that we'll come to later uh, has a lot less uh, proof, of, you know, uh, proof by prior examples. Uh, whereas with natural risks, uh, we have had uh, many large asteroid and comet impacts, uh, for example. Uh, these types of uh, uh, Im impact or events uh, cause global cooling and plant death on a massive scale. Uh, so that's how they kill. Um, so generally by blocking sunlight uh, through the dust or ash that's produced and then that leading to the vegetation dying which then leads to uh, the animals dying. Uh, and we know that uh, asteroids and comets uh, have caused, well, at least uh, serious damage. There is some, some doubt about this stuff still, uh, but uh, a lot of people think that uh, uh, such an event uh, caused the KT uh, mass extinction, which is the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, uh, which is where the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago. Uh, another type of uh, uh, big natural risk uh, is uh, uh, super eruptions. Uh, so there are various volcanoes, uh, which are called super volcanoes, which are much larger uh, than uh, regular ones and would uh, uh, I think it's because they release a lot of sulfur dioxide, actually, uh, that causes this. I'm not entirely sure of the, the causal mechanism. Um, but again, they cause a lot of global cooling and plant death. Uh, so perhaps that is the uh, likely way things go with uh, natural risks. Um, and they're thought to have caused uh, several mass extinctions. And this is out of a number of five mass extinctions. So you know, several is, is quite, going quite well. Um, now, uh, there are various ways you could try to bound uh, the natural risk. So we could try to uh, quantify each natural risk. Uh, and I think this would be very difficult. I actually, I don't really know that it would be possible. Um, 
but if one could try to go through each of these risk categories, so you could say, okay, what about asteroids or comets or uh, super volcanoes or pandemics or um, looking through lots of different uh, forms of risk, taking each one, trying to find out a lot more about the subject matter, uh, and then trying to work out, and this is the really tricky bit, uh, the chance that it would cause the extinction of humanity. Um, uh, so that, that would be very difficult. Um, I'm going to show you how to do a shortcut so that you don't actually need to know about what the different extinction risks are. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages of that. One is that it's actually much more tractable to get results. Um, and you'll see that it's not that hard to actually bound the natural extinction <laughs> risk uh, if you use this technique. Uh, and if you, it has this nice advantage that if you tried to go through them all uh, one by one, uh, then you could easily leave out uh, a very important extinction risk uh, that you weren't aware of, uh, whereas the technique I'm trying to use will capture them all at once. And so it's guaranteed to uh, not have that problem. And uh, what I'm going to look at in particular uh, in this natural risk section uh, is three different approaches uh, to estimating the natural extinction risk. Uh, one is by looking at uh, how long humanity has survived so far. Uh, the second one is looking at similar species and their survival times. And the third one is looking at the uh, mass extinctions. Uh, so the mass extinction record, how long is it between mass extinctions? So here's a, uh, a sketch of an argument. Uh, Homo sapiens, our species, has survived for 2,000 centuries so far. Uh, during that time, it was vulnerable uh, to all of these natural risks. Uh, so it's unlikely we would go extinct uh, from these risks in the next century. Since we survived 2,000 of them, uh, it seems, you know, one couldn't think there's a 50% chance that we'll go extinct in the next century from these things uh, without uh, some further argument. Um, so we can make this a bit more precise. Uh, so what we're trying to work out here is uh, the probability of extinction uh, per century. Uh, a naive type of calculation might be to say uh, that it is uh, uh, one in 2,000. If there are 2,000 centuries, then the chance of going extinct next century might be one in 2,000. Certainly a number that would occur to one. Uh, however, that's, that would be uh, the correct type of answer if we had gone extinct um, once in 2,000 centuries. We've gone extinct zero times in 2,000 centuries, so one in 2,000 uh, isn't quite the right thing. Uh, and zero in 2,000 also wouldn't be quite the right thing. It's, it's fairly obvious in that case uh, that you can't say the chance is zero just because it's never happened so far. Uh, so you need some slightly more powerful uh, ways of thinking about this. Um, and. Uh, but you can see that the uh, intuitive answer should be less than 1 in 2,000, um, since that's kind of what you'd expect if we'd gone extinct once in 2,000 uh, centuries. Uh, so what you can do here is uh, use Bayesian statistics, uh, particularly something called uh, Laplace's law of succession, um, uh, where you try to work out the probability of an event which is so far unprecedented. Uh, and the way you do this is you start off with a prior probability distribution uh, and then you update that based on the evidence. Um, I won't go into all the details of what uh, yeah, Bayesian priors are and so forth, uh, but for those of you who already know, uh, you, you should be able to see what I'm doing. Uh, so one way to do that, and the way that Laplace originally did it when he tried to c calculate things with his uh, law, uh, is to use a uniform or flat prior. Um, so the idea there is to say, at the start, you assume that the probability of uh, the event occurring could be anything between 0 and 1. Uh, and it has as much chance of being between 0 and 0.1 as it does between 0.1 and 0.2, or 0.2 and 0.3, and so forth. Uh, so it's just, you can see, uh, you can see here uh, that it's uh, just a flat distribution. If you do that and you crunch the numbers uh, and you say, suppose that, that the, uh, the actual probability per century uh, uh, before I know anything, I think it's equally likely to be anywhere, and then I notice that it hasn't happened 2,000 times in a row, uh, you get the result uh, 1 in 2002, uh, which is indeed less than 1 in 2,000, uh, but not much less. Um, uh, I think a more sensible way of using the uh, Bayesian statistics is to use a Jeffreys prior, uh, which is uh, on the right there. And the Jeffreys prior uh, has the probability uh, it's more likely for things to be near zero and one uh, than in some other place. And I think you can intuitively reflect upon that if you think, uh, is it, if you just think of some event uh, that someone tells you about and you know nothing about the subject matter, 
Uh, maybe they ask you about uh, what's the chance that a certain Pokemon will beat another Pokemon or something, and, and you have no idea about this, uh, this subject matter. Uh, it's, uh, it's more likely the probability is between, say, 0% and 1% than it is between 37% and 38%. Um, they just turn out to be quite a lot of things which are very unlikely or very likely. Uh, these probabilities get clustered towards 0 and 1. Um, uh, and the Jeffreys prior is a mathematical way of, take, of interpreting this. It's also called a maximum entropy prior. Uh, so if you use this Jeffreys prior, you get the number 1 in 4002. And you're not going to have to just take my word for this, so we'll see some more ways uh, of looking at these things. Uh, this is just one of them. Uh, but I think that the Jeffreys Prior is a pretty reasonable way of answering this question uh, and would give you the idea of extinction at about 1 in 4,002 uh, per century uh, from natural causes. Okay, uh, but another way to do this, which is perhaps more sensible, uh, certainly used commonly in science, uh, is to use p-values. Um, and so the idea here, uh, here's an intuitive uh, argument. Uh, if the chance of extinction per century uh, were 1%, uh, then we would have survived 2,099% uh, chances in a row. Um, each one we're quite likely to get through, but surviving 2,000 of them sounds fairly unlikely. And if you crunch the numbers on how unlikely it is, uh, you'd find that there would only be a 0.000002% uh, chance of getting through that many uh, centuries in a row. Um, so that seems to be an argument that the, uh, the chance per century is lower than 1%. Uh, and uh, you can kind of formalize this. Uh, I've got a table here with some different p-values. Um, so the way that you read this table is you say, uh, if you look at the bottom row first, I guess, and you say, uh, if uh, the Basically, that if the probability were greater than 0.03%, uh, then there would have been a 0.5 chance of going extinct by now, uh, p.05. Uh, if the probability had been per century had been greater than 0.1%, uh, then uh, there only, would have only been a 0.05 chance uh, of getting to where we are now. So only a 5% chance we would have made it through. Um, and uh, the, th the third one is with a p-value of uh, 0 0.01. Uh, commonly, uh, for some reason, in scientific studies, they tend to use 0 0.05 um, uh, for no, no apparent reason. Um, uh, but you can, you can see what the relevant value would give you here. Uh, so one way of roughly understanding this that isn't, isn't quite right is to say that third column says that we're 99% confident that the probability of extinction per century is less than 0.2%. Um, that's not quite right. Um, a better way to say it is that if it were more than 0.2%, then a 1 in 100 event has occurred. Um, we got exceptionally lucky uh, in terms of surviving this far. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, you'd have good reason to believe, perhaps, that a 1 in 100 event did occur. Uh, suppose you looked at every other species' lifespan and you found that all other species uh, only lived uh, you know, for uh, 100 centuries um, and you know, no other species lived longer than 100 centuries or something like that. You might think, well, it sounds like the probability you'd expect to be around about 1% per century uh, and that I guess we did get spectacularly lucky. It's perhaps more likely that we got spectacularly lucky than that we're a fluke species. Um, so in some cases you might think that uh, that basically for, for the probability per century to be less than 0.2% would be even more unlikely for some other reason than that a 1 in 100 event occurred. And so it is possible in some cases if you have some outside evidence to push back against these p-values. Um, and that's, that's true when they come up in the scientific literature uh, generally. Uh, but uh, as we'll see later, the other species lifespans are actually quite a lot longer than 100 centuries uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything that does push back on this. Uh, and uh, I think that, it, that they stand up reasonably well. It looks like it's, it is very unlikely uh, that uh, the probability of extinction uh, from natural causes is greater than 0.2%. Uh, there are some assumptions behind all of this, which I'll get to in a second as well. So uh, a, uh, a further question that we could ask uh, is, what is humanity? Uh, I was using Homo sapiens here, uh, but you could use some other definitions as well. Um, I think most people really include Homo sapiens, uh, so all members of the species Homo sapiens who have ever lived as part of humanity. Uh, but you could use broader definitions. I'm not sure many people would use narrower definitions. Um, 
but if you used, uh, if you went, if you thought that the Neanderthals are uh, quite similar to us in various ways, and uh, indeed, indeed, there are a lot of commonalities. Uh, you could look back far enough in time to when uh, the last common ancestor between uh, uh, humans and uh, Neanderthals, uh, which will take you back 5,000 centuries. Uh, you could look as far back as there have been tool-using hominids. Um, so, uh, you know, our ancestors who used tools uh, of various forms and made their own tools, I think, in particular here. Uh, and that would take you back 26,000 centuries. Uh, or you could, you could look at the entire... Uh, homo uh, genus, uh, and that will take you back uh, 60,000 centuries. So there's some other definitions you could use. Uh, then I have the numbers here for if you use the naive calculation or the flat prior or the Jeffreys prior. Um, and basically what you'll note is that uh, the number in the top right-hand corner there, 0.02% uh, uh, is the highest of the numbers. Uh, and what I'm really trying to argue in this uh, section We'll notice this uh, when we get to the anthropogenic risks, but basically is that the natural risks are less than 1% per century. Uh, so I'm showing a whole lot of different techniques and they're all producing values which are going to be less than 1% and generally substantially less than 1%. Um, and, uh, but they do give us a range of values. Uh, but 1% should be the, I mean, I'm showing you enough numbers that you'll probably lose track of what's going on unless you have some kind of uh, anchor point to compare them to and uh, consider how close they are to 1%. Uh, now, below that, I have uh, different p-values uh, using this p-value approach uh, for the different, uh, different definitions of what humanity is. And uh, if we go to the most extreme right-hand column, I'm now looking at uh, p of uh, 0 0.001. Uh, so there'd have to be a one in a thousand event occurred uh, for these numbers to be wrong. Um, and even then, you could see that, uh, and even on the, the most conservative definition of humanity, just as homo sapiens, uh, that uh, 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 with a p-value of uh, 0 0.001, uh, it's less than a third of a percent uh, per century as the, uh, the risk. Okay, uh, so that was trying to look at uh, humanity uh, that we've survived for a very long time and hadn't gone extinct, and to try to get some numbers from that. Uh, now let's look at related species, uh, which is another way you can try to bound all of the natural risks put together. So uh, we can look at some other species which are extinct, uh, and then we don't have the problem of having a zero uh, in the numerator when we're trying to uh, do some of our calculations. Um, so you could just, just do those naive calculations, which I've got on the right-hand side here, um, for different uh, species, uh, uh, Neanderthals uh, and uh, various other hominids. Uh, they again give you some pretty low numbers. Um, you could also look at, uh, you can see the second last row there is for the average mammal, uh, which lasts between 10,000 and 20,000 centuries. Um, uh, or the, uh, if you look at the entire fossil record of different species of all different types, uh, vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, and uh, that are at least fossilized, obviously it's hard to get numbers for the ones that don't fossilize, um, and you get uh, again some very low numbers uh, for risk per century. Uh, in general, a century is a pretty small time uh, on a geological time scale, and it's, it's pretty unusual for species to go extinct within any given century. Uh, you could also run those things uh, with more sensible techniques, uh, such as those I mentioned with the flat prior or the Jeffreys prior or using p-values, and you get numbers which are very similar to the table of numbers you just saw. Uh, this is not that surprising because the number of centuries I have uh, in these different bits are very similar to the numbers of centuries uh, that I was looking at before uh, for different uh, definitions of humanity. And you crunch the numbers through and you get numbers which are very similar to these ones uh, and, and to the ones you just saw. Okay, so a uh, third way of doing this is to look at uh, the mass extinction record. Uh, so humans are so widely spread uh, and so very capable at defending ourselves and adapting uh, that it's uh, plausible that it might require something at the level of a mass extinction in order to wipe us out. Uh, that sounds pretty plausible to me. Um, uh, and if so, uh, then uh, people typically talk of the big five mass extinctions uh, I should say there's a, there's a bit of pushback on that recently that, that uh, it's hard to actually come up with a definition such that only five count as mass extinctions, uh, even though that's what's commonly talked about. Uh, uh, there may be more, which 
Um, uh, but if you just use the big five, uh, you get five mass extinctions in 540 million years, uh, which is about one uh, per million centuries. Uh, so if you just do a simple calculation on that, you get an implicit probability of 0.001% uh, per century. Uh, and this is, this is quite a bit lower than the other methods. Um, so if it would really require mass extinction to wipe us out, uh, then we're quite a bit safer from natural risks uh, uh, than the other things would have said. Uh, and this would remain the case unless you counted more than 100 things as mass extinctions. Uh, and while there's some debate about whether there's only five, uh, people aren't normally counting 100 things as mass extinctions. And if you're thinking the kind of thing that killed the dinosaurs, that's the kind of thing that would be needed in order to kill us, uh, then you're looking at uh, once every 100 million years or every million centuries. Um, and so the expected amount of time we could survive from now would be about a million centuries before something like that happened. Um, so uh, that would be pretty good news for us if we, if we managed to do that. Um, I imagine a lot of you would be not that optimistic that we would uh, get through <laughs> uh, a million centuries uh, of uh, uh, risks caused by ourselves um, before we got wiped out by such a thing. Uh, there were various uh, assumptions behind uh, the three different types of argument that I just showed you. Uh, and I should flag they're very rough estimates. Uh, maybe I should have said that at the start uh, to avoid people uh, worrying too much about that. Uh, that's why I only use one significant figure in each of them. Uh, I'm trying to just use them to establish a rough upper bound. Um, so, if, so basically to say, uh, here are some back of the envelope ways of trying to calculate and bound this. Uh, using a few different techniques, getting relatively convergent answers, uh, and making it so that if someone wanted to say, oh, I think the natural extinction rate uh, for humanity is more than 1% per century, the burden of proof would really be on them to see why on earth they could come up with something like that, given that it just seems like it's very hard to explain how we could survive uh, 2,000 centuries if you think there's a, we only survive 100 centuries on average, um, and so forth. Uh, and they also assumed a constant risk per century, which is a bit more controversial. Uh, although, actually, they, uh, all I really need there is that the risk isn't increasing. Um, if the risk were decreasing over time, uh, then the risk in the next century would be lower than these numbers would make it look, uh, if I've been assuming a constant risk. Uh, so the real assumption here uh, that I'm relying on is that the risk of natural uh, extinction isn't increasing. Um, and I think in most cases, that's a pretty good assumption uh, because we've got a whole lot of, I mean, we've spread to many different niches. Uh, we've spread to many different continents. Uh, we're generally looks like we're much more robust uh, than a typical species. Uh, however, um, there's some potentially one big counterexample, which is pandemics, um, uh, including uh, in some sense naturally caused pandemics. Um, so we're not talking about genetic engineering here. Uh, and I think of pandemics as being a kind of intermediate, in an intermediate category between natural risks and anthropogenic risks, as uh, they arise from natural origins, uh, but they're very much exacerbated by uh, human society uh, and also human uh, technology. Uh, so the fact that we can travel, and people do travel, uh, many people travel uh, halfway around the world every day, uh, you know, joining points. Uh, on opposite sides of the world uh, within a few hours uh, in terms of sharing their uh, germs with each other and spreading things around. Uh, we've, we've done a very good job of making the whole thing mix very thoroughly, very regularly. Uh, this can cause problems. Uh, we also raise uh, livestock in, very intensively um, and in some cases with related animals, which we know give us diseases. Uh, you know, think of bird flu. Um, and. So there are a whole lot of things going on there where I don't expect the, uh, I don't feel safe in thinking that the natural um, historical record for pandemics uh, is uh, that that's, the risk is necessarily uh, decreasing. Uh, it feels like it could well be increasing. Uh, so that's one where uh, I, uh, I want to bracket that. And when I talk about natural risks uh, for the rest of this, uh, don't include pandemics. So in summary uh, for this section, uh, all of the estimates we have here uh, for natural risks uh, give risks of uh, uh, less than 1%. Uh, 
The highest one was an upper bound of 0.3%, and that was an upper bound and would say that you'd have to have a one in a thousand event to occur to even get to that point. Um, and that involved the narrowest definition of humanity uh, and the most extreme confidence. And uh, most of the risks uh, ranged from 0.002% uh, to 0.1% per century. Uh, so it thus seems difficult from what we've seen so far uh, to assume a natural risk of greater than uh, about a tenth of a percent uh, and untenable to assume greater than 1%. At least so I would claim. Uh, maybe someone has some good argument for why, uh, you know, why one of these assumptions fails or something like that. Uh, but that's, that's what it looks like to me. Okay, so uh, let's move on and look at some anthropogenic risks. Uh, and you'll be uh, not that surprised to hear that these are much more difficult to estimate. And uh, uh, basically, I can't use the trick that I used before. Uh, here's what happens if you try to use the trick. Um, so, uh, so in this case, suppose you try to assume uh, we had certain amounts of small amounts of technology from the Neolithic period. Uh, so if you say, well, what about the types of anthropogenic risks which we could have caused from the Neolithic period onwards? Uh, you might think that there aren't any. Uh, it's actually not, not totally clear. Uh, one type of risk uh, that we face uh, are various forms of government risks, uh, uh, government democides, where the governments kill their own people as an example of a risk. Uh, and there are, you know, many millions of people were killed in the 20th century from that. Uh, I think around, a similar amount as were killed by war, um, were killed by governments killing their own people. Um, uh, so uh, uh, maybe it could have been the case that once you know we developed uh, societies and uh, uh, had an agricultural revolution uh, that we're in the situation where we could start doing certain types of social risks, um, but uh, which would count as man-made, um, but doesn't sound all that likely. Uh, uh, that would give you a hundred centuries to work with, uh, which would actually let you do a little bit of a calculation. Um, getting numbers like 0.5% or less than 3%. Uh, however, it's not really what we're thinking about with the anthropogenic risks. It certainly doesn't include most of them. There's no nuclear weapons there or anything. It's not telling us about a lot of these things. If you try to get uh, a more uh, close you know, uh, understanding of a technological risk of some sort, uh, say uh, looking at the time since the Industrial Revolution, uh, this gives you two and a half centuries, uh, which is not enough time to get sensible numbers. Uh, the Jeffreys prior gives us 20% uh, at that point uh, of extinction risk per century, but it's it's you know it's a very rubbery number because it's based on so few data points, uh, and uh, the the to have a p value of 0.05, it says you know you'd need it. Uh, uh, all of that says is that the uh, uh, the risk is less than 70 percent, but it doesn't say where uh, less than 70 percent. And less than 70 percent includes a lot of risks, right? It includes. Uh, one in a billion per century, and it includes 50% uh, per century. So it's just a really uninformative number. Uh, and if you look at the time since nuclear weapons, it's even more like that. Um, I think that there might be some things you could do with those numbers. Uh, for example, if you look at how long we've survived since nuclear weapons, uh, that at least gives us some indication that uh, you know one can survive uh, 70 years uh, <laughs> with nuclear weapons, which wasn't obvious at the time. Uh, some people, I think, thought that uh, we were doomed to much shorter time scale than that. And you might be able to do some kind of analysis there, uh, but I'm not going to try to do that tonight. Uh, so yes, there's not enough data to sensibly use the Bayesian approach, and the p-values approach just gives us very weak upper bounds. Um, and also, the upper bounds wouldn't help us compare against the natural risks because we had upper bounds for them as well. Uh, what I want here is more like a lower bound, uh, to bound it uh, away from the other uh, probabilities in order to get a result. Uh, we could look at anthropogenic extinction of other species, uh, which we do all the time. Uh, you know, humanity is very good at uh, making species go extinct, uh, and uh, sadly, uh, but uh, that doesn't look like it's particularly relevant. I, I can't see how to get any kind of useful number out of that. Uh, so let's look at uh, three different examples uh, of anthropogenic risks uh, in order to think a little bit more uh, and try to get a, a bit of a feeling for what the probability is. Uh, you can see that this is not going to be producing really nice crisp numbers, I'm afraid. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to suggest that um, once you look at the cases, it's pretty difficult to put numbers which are as low as the numbers that we were putting for the natural risks. Um, uh, but I'm not going to be able to make a very tight argument about that. Uh, so uh, the 
uh, total uh, energy of the current nuclear arsenals, uh, which were reduced from their peak, um, uh, is about 80,000 times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, there's a lot of energy there, um, but the risk isn't that uh, everyone will get exploded um, by nuclear bombs. Uh, the risk is that the cities will get exploded. Uh, the cities contain a lot of flammable materials. Uh, the materials in the cities will burn. Uh, a lot of people will be destroyed uh, if there was an all-out nuclear exchange uh, in that initial exchange. Uh, but, uh, but that's not the extinction worry, um, because even though uh, at the, in fact, we've just passed 50% urbanization of the world, so 50% of the world's population uh, live in cities now. Uh, but that still leaves 50% uh, quite widely dispersed uh, in rural areas. Uh, and they're not going to be destroyed in blasts by nuclear exchange. Uh, however, the burning of the cities uh, produces soot, uh, which rises up into the atmosphere. Uh, quite a lot of it gets higher than, uh, than uh, the clouds and doesn't come back down again in rainfall very quickly. Uh, and so it stays around, uh, blocks out a lot of sunlight, uh, leads to uh, uh, cooling and health <coughs> failure. Uh, there's surprisingly little research on nuclear winter. Uh, there are you know, a, a few government studies and a few papers, uh, and uh, there's some recent research, which I'll show you in a second. Um, it may not uh, lead directly to human extinction. It's not clear that a nuclear winter would be enough to make uh, our species extinct. Uh, we might be able to get through it, at least some people. Uh, it would be very bleak. Uh, it certainly would be a a uh, incredibly bad global catastrophic risk, uh, but it might not be extinction. Um, uh, however, there, there, it might be. We just don't really know that much about it. Uh, and it also uh, would leave us uh, less able to recover from other things that would happen if, it was, if there was also a big pandemic uh, in, say, the 100 or two years after. Uh, that could be something that could be difficult to recover from. Uh, it would be vulnerable to other types of threats. Uh, we also uh, may never rebuild civilization uh, in the same way that we have it now. Uh, you, you might think that would be good in some ways. Uh, there are you know, perhaps some problems we made this time around and maybe we wouldn't make them. Uh, but by the same token, uh, there could be some other things like general enlightenment values uh, might not come back uh, the second time around. Uh, it could be more that it's built up in a despotic kind of style and uh, democracy doesn't flourish again. It's, it's really quite unclear. Uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, I, I would think that if there was an all-out nuclear exchange, that the chance of human extinction, from what I've seen of this, would be less than a half, uh, probably quite a lot less than half, uh, but uh, still be looking very bad. Um, uh, I, I'm not, with this section, I'm really not trying to actually just make you believe the same numbers that I believe, rather just to, to share some of the, uh, uh, the information that I've thought about in this. Actually, here is, a, I said there was a recent study on this. Uh, this is their model of, um, of soot spread. Uh, the uh, original detonation is, I think, on the 14th of May. So this is uh, 10 days later. And uh, uh, it's somewhat good news for the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but, uh, uh, but this is just within the first uh, month. And I think that it, I think a lot of it does eventually end up in the Southern Hemisphere as well. It's, it's uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not good. Uh, and you might think that at least we, you know, we didn't have an all-out nuclear war, um, uh, but we did get close to it on quite a number of occasions. Uh, and with, I mean, it, you might think that there was this great uh, mutually assured destruction policy, uh, which you know the game theory was all sorted out by people at Rand, and uh, I, I, probably no one's thinking that. But uh, um, you know, people indeed thought about the game theory and worked out this approach such that they build the arsenals <coughs> large enough, then it would be insane for the other people to launch, uh, which, is, uh, which is true. However, various insane things did happen, and uh, I, this type of brinkmanship can make it worse if there are insane things happening. So here are an example of some of the things that did happen. Uh, in 62, there was uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, uh, during which uh, there were a number of uh, really quite amazing incidents. Um, uh, Kennedy uh, put the odds of nuclear war at that time uh, between a third and a half. Um, so he was, and, and he should know since he would have been one of the people starting it. <laughs> um, uh, and they were very worried. Um, uh, there was actually, there's a fantastic uh, documentary that's been made about this uh, where uh, Castro uh, uh, 
had talked quite a bit. It's actually, it mainly features Robert McNamara, who's uh, describing uh, interactions with Castro. And uh, uh, there's, there's a part where, uh, uh, where McNamara is explaining this uh, meeting they had, um, I think in the 90s, uh, uh, you know, long after the missile crisis. And they were, it was basically a debrief on the whole thing. And, uh, they, and uh, McNamara asked uh, Castro, uh, I think, a few questions. So one was, uh, uh, did they have nuclear missiles that were under uh, Cuban control? Uh, if they did, uh, would they have launched them against the US? And if they had launched them against the US, uh, uh, did they know what the consequences of that would be? And, uh, and Castro answered that, uh, they did not have uh, any that were under Cuban control, although they tried to uh, argue with the Russians to, to get them under Cuban control, uh, that if they had them, uh, then at the height of the conflict, they would have launched them uh, to the south of the US, which is as far as they could reach, I think, uh, and that the consequence of that would have been the destruction of Cuba. Um, so, uh, uh, so that was Castro's view, according to Castro, uh, was that he would have uh, caused a nuclear exchange uh, if, if he'd had the ability to do so at the time. Uh, it's a very sobering, uh, uh, that's called Fog of War, so I encourage people to have a look at that. Um, uh, in 79, uh, there was the training tape incident uh, where a, uh, basically a training uh, computer program um, that uh, went through a, uh, a drill uh, as if there was a nuclear war. Um, uh, it was interpreted as being real. Um, so it's like when the fire alarm goes off and you're not sure if it's a drill or not. Uh, but uh, four different nuclear command centers uh, weren't informed that there was going to be a drill and thought that there was a real Russian first strike uh, at the time uh, and mobilized quite far uh, towards uh, retaliating. Um, uh, in 1980, there was the faulty computer chip incident, uh, which caused displays to show uh, launched enemy nuclear missiles. And so all the people in the command centers had a whole enemy attack appearing on their, their screens, uh, but didn't launch back. In 83, uh, there was the Able Archer incident. Uh, that was a, uh, a NATO exercise, uh, military exercise uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, which was interpreted as it being a real attack by the USSR, who didn't know that, that, that there was a, uh, a test. Um, and again, they escalated quite far. Uh, in 83, there was the uh, Autumn Equinox incident, uh, where uh, sun on clouds uh, was uh, uh, reflecting in the stratosphere, I think. Uh, th basically, they have uh, the uh, systems to detect nuclear launches. Uh, the way they do it is they get a satellite. If this is the Earth, they get a satellite very far from the Earth on a highly elliptical orbit, such that it spends most of its time out here, because that's the way elliptical orbits work. They're, they're very slow out here and very fast in there. Um, and when it's out here, it looks at this piece of the sky uh, above the US to see whether there's any flares from, the, uh, from rockets. And it sees bright light if there is a flare. Um, and uh, it saw a whole lot of bright light and detected uh, launches. They appeared on the command screens. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, USSR uh, didn't do a counter-strike. That's where uh, uh, Petrov, uh, a, uh, a Russian uh, commander, uh, uh, didn't escalate. Uh, he chose not to because he thought that it, it would be too implausible. I think, I think what they saw was that it was a small first strike. And they thought just the US wouldn't do that. So we're just going to ignore it. Uh, and I won't tell my superiors about it. And uh, he didn't do very well in his career after that, because um, uh, uh, that, that wasn't the kind of attitude that they wanted. The whole idea of the mutually assured destruction was that you know, our people are crazy enough that they're going to, they're going to push the button. Uh, they needed to get that, uh, uh, that locked in in order to uh, make the game theory work. Um, and uh, then after the Cold War, there have still been uh, pretty serious incidents. Uh, you might think that we're safe now. Um, in 95, uh, there was the Norwegian rocket incident, uh, which uh, a yeah, Norwegian uh, weather rocket uh, was launched um, actually away from Russia. Uh, and uh, so somehow uh, the Russians interpreted this as a, uh, as a nuclear strike. Um, and it got as far as opening the, uh, the three Russian nuclear briefcases uh, uh, you know, w with the controls to do the launch um, and then got stopped. Uh, and even though we're in, uh, you know, relative peacetime now, <laughs> maybe if I'd written this talk a couple of years ago, it's, it's a bit less good again. Uh, but tensions could escalate. Uh, we could get back into a Cold War type situation, uh, particularly if we're thinking about the risks over a century or several centuries. Um, you know, one would expect it to move back towards a mean. Uh, you could also think to yourself about 
uh, the chance of, uh, you know, would there have been all out nuclear war if, uh, if we'd had the Second World War at a time when we had mature nuclear <coughs> weapons technology? Uh, and it looks pretty plausible that there would have been. Uh, if we, so if we end up in another situation of total war, um, uh, which we've had, you know, many times, we've got, we've got a track record of that, uh, then it doesn't look too good. Uh, so it seems to me that there is, you know, quite a reasonable chance of uh, all-out nuclear exchanges, uh, albeit it's not, that doesn't equal extinction. There'd still be more steps you'd have to go through, uh, but it would it'd be very bad. Uh, a, uh, another example here, the second example, uh, is uh, artificial pandemics. Uh, so people engineering their own uh, viruses, probably, uh, although you could do uh, bacteria. Um, there's an increasing ability to genetically engineer pathogens, um, uh, and with lots of different ways to do this. Um, uh, and uh, a nightmare scenario would be something that combined uh, the infectiousness of the common cold uh, with the deadliness of rabies. Uh, so I think one person has survived rabies. Uh, it had 100% lethality until I think somewhat recently where someone somehow survived. So maybe it's not as... No. Uh, maybe deadliness just slightly more than rabies. Uh, and uh, the incubation period of HIV. Uh, so if you had something that spread like a cold, uh, but it took a year before uh, anyone showed any symptoms, uh, and once they started to become symptomatic, uh, they had 100% mortality, uh, then basically uh, almost everyone would be infected uh, before we found out anything about what was going on. Uh, naturally occurring diseases don't combine these, uh, these three aspects, but they do all occur separately, and uh, uh, one could genetically engineer these types of things. I'm not sure exactly how difficult it is to do that. Uh, uh, I don't really want people, <laughs> I'm not sure how much research we want on finding out, uh, but uh, there are definitely some, some scary looking possibilities to do with uh, artificial pandemics. Um, you might think, who on earth would want to do that? Uh, which is a pretty good question. Uh, relatively few people would want to do that. Uh, the Aum Shinriko uh, cult uh, that did the sarin bombings uh, in Tokyo, uh, they wanted to do stuff like this. Uh, so you do occasional, and they were using, they were getting scientists, uh, they had at least one scientist on their team uh, to develop the, 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 the nerve gas that they used. Uh, so uh, there are groups who have access to uh, to scientists uh, who do occasionally uh, want to kill everyone. Um, but this is not just a kind of terrorism uh, type thing. Um, uh, you've, it's a very particular type of it that would lead to wanting to do this type of thing. However, unfortunately, uh, these technologies are becoming more and more accessible. Um, at the moment, the accessibility probably just looks like mainly a good thing, uh, because instead of needing, uh, you know, uh, a PhD and 20 years of experience in the lab of people or something in order to uh, engineer your own viruses. Uh, it's moving down, uh, you know, you don't even need a, a PhD. Uh, there's, a, in terms of synthetic biology, there's a, a very uh, prominent competition now that for school children uh, doing uh, synthetic biology. Uh, so that's a, a fairly radical forms of genetic engineering. Uh, not on viruses, I don't think, but... Um, uh, so it's becoming more and more accessible. And you can see that once, uh, if we've got this idea of, you know, who would want to do this? Well, very few people. Um, you know, it's a tiny fraction of people want to do it. But how accessible is it? Well, it's getting more and more and more accessible. Uh, and as it gets accessible enough, then even if there's very few people who want to do it, um, some of them will have access to it. Uh, and things like this will happen. Uh, which, so I don't think it's all that scary next year or the year after. Uh, but if we look over the next 100 years, I think this type of thing is pretty scary unless we work out as a society how to actually stop it. Uh, and my third example of a uh, uh, anthropogenic risk uh, is artificial intelligence. Um, so we currently have many uh, narrow AI systems, uh, for example, chess playing uh, computers, um, uh, which are smarter than us at particular things, but very narrow things. You know, less than 1% of what we do is chess, I hope. Uh, um, uh, so. Uh, they look at very narrow topics and are very good at them. Or multiplication would be a, a more obvious example. Um, uh, but they're not good at general intelligence. Uh, uh, but if we were to develop machines which had general intelligence uh, greater than that of humans, which could do kind of all the tasks that we could do um, as well as we could, uh, or even just you know half the tasks we can do, or something, something close in, uh, approaching that, um, then that would be a momentous uh, development, uh, possibly 
uh, well, you know, possibly the biggest news on the earth since the advent of Homo sapiens. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't mean that to be uh, grand, grandiose for Homo sapiens. I mean, Homo sapiens have been very big news on the earth, uh, sadly, <coughs> mainly in a negative way so far uh, in terms of uh, changing things. But, you know, uh, we're clearly the most dominant species on the planet. Um, hence the moves to rename the current uh, uh, era the uh, Anthropocene. And uh, the reason that we're the most dominant species on the planet is not because we're the strongest or you know, the fastest or something like that. There are a very large number of species and what we are is the smartest and uh, that's what's let us get there. Um, uh, so if we created something that was smarter than us, uh, we would no longer have that unique uh, position and uh, Seems, uh, you might think, at least somewhat plausible that, uh, that we would also no longer be the uh, dominant uh, species on the planet. Uh, this becomes more likely as well when you think uh, very carefully about the difficulties in controlling AI and in aligning its goals with our own goals. Um, there's been a reasonable amount of it written on this recently. Some of it's a bit silly in the newspapers. Uh, so I'm not talking about a kind of uh, Terminator type situation. Um, uh, but if you program uh, a computer with, with some kind of goal, um, say calculating as many digits of pi as possible, um, you know, just to pick a, an example of something which is a maximizing goal, uh, but which doesn't have anything about humans directly in it, uh, it feels kind of neutral to humans, it's just orthogonal. Um, uh, it certainly doesn't, it's not malevolent towards humans or anything like that. It gives them no intrinsic value at all, no positive value, no negative value. Uh, however, uh, if you were very smart, uh, probably people in this room could, you know, have worked out that, uh, uh, that if you wanted to calculate a lot of digits of pi, uh, you might want to, say, at least take over the internet with a kind of botnet type attack, um, and humans wouldn't really like that. Uh, if you want to calculate a lot more digits of pi, uh, uh, if you think about uh, the long-term future, uh, you know, maybe you'd want to uh, have all the resources of the planet, if you had all the resources of the galaxy, you'd have even more digits you could calculate. Uh, there's, you could actually potentially do very well at this task if you achieve certain things, uh, but those things are not compatible with uh, a flourishing future human civilization. Uh, and so it would, you would then be aware that humans didn't like this, and then it would turn out to be an instrumental goal would be to stop the human stopping you from achieving these types of things. So that's the, the standard type of line of thought here, is that even if you start with something that just feels orthogonal to human interests, um, there's no malevolence. Uh, it turns out that, uh, that if, it's, if it involves a desire, an insatiable desire for resources, uh, then that's incompatible with long-term flourishing of humanity. Um, so that would lead to an instrumental goal uh, to at least block humans and stop them uh, getting many of the resources. Uh, so there's been a lot of thought about this recently. Uh, Nick Bostrom has a very good book on this uh, called Superintelligence, um, looking at some of these scenarios and trying to understand these arguments. Uh, there are various attempts people have had to try to work out how could you stop that happening. I mean, maybe the problem is just goals like calculate the digits of pi, and maybe you could have better goals. It's not that easy to get this to work, and uh, uh, there's a flourishing area, though, now of, of, uh, of thought about this, and uh, if you know, any young people are interested in, uh, I think that there will be jobs in this uh, in the uh, near future. Um, uh, in, that is, in trying to understand uh, the risks and trying to work out how to prevent them. Um, and uh, all of this is made uh, worse if development is very sudden. Uh, so one example of sudden development that people talk about uh, is an intelligence explosion. Uh, I.J. Good uh, uh, came up with this idea um, quite a long time ago now, uh, and about 50 years, uh, where the idea is that if you had a system which was uh, sufficiently smart that it was smarter than the entire AI research community, uh, then the amount it could improve itself by would be greater, the amount of work it could do in AI research would be greater than the humans. Um, and it could improve itself and make itself better and then make itself better again. And, uh, uh, and maybe uh, this would lead to a runaway uh, improvement in its own intelligence. There are a couple of questions about the argument. Um, for example, it's compatible with it being asymptoting towards some kind of intelligence. Maybe it, it gets smarter and then smarter and then smarter and then smarter and smarter and smarter, and smarter you know, uh, but never passes some threshold of intelligence. It's not really clear exactly what would happen with the argument, and that's something that we're trying to actually understand a bit better. Are these intelligence explosions actually likely or, or not? Uh, but it's something that's been theorized and would lead potentially to a rapid uh, increase, such that uh, a system that people previously didn't put a whole lot of thought into or worry that it would get out of control rapidly gets out of control. 
even just widespread deployment could do this. Uh, if you had a system that was as, uh, uh, that was, uh, as intelligent as a person uh, and could run on a single uh, desktop computer, uh, then if you uh, were to uh, deploy it on, say, everyone's computers, uh, let, let's even just say 10% of the computers uh, via internet uh, hacking attack, um, then uh, you would have something which had more uh, intellectual uh, force than, say, the entirety of the US. Uh, because it would, if each one is as, uh, as intellectually powerful as a human, and then you've got more than 300 million of them. So there are even just some really rapid things that could happen in terms of scaling up the hardware. Uh, also, if Moore's Law is still going at that point, then the population of them could be uh, doubling every 18 months. Uh, so there's some, there's some reasons why things could move very quickly in this area, and it could be hard to get things sorted out before the technology develops. Uh, so, a couple of questions on this one. Uh, what's the probability of this arriving this century? Um, if I were to guess about this, I've thought about it a reasonable amount, but you don't need to take my word for it. Uh, I would think uh, maybe 40% uh, or 50% or something this, uh, that this century will have things which are smarter than humans. There's certainly been a lot of uh, uh, very good progress recently. There were, progress had stalled for a while in the, uh, the 80s and 90s, but there's, it's gone a lot faster recently. Um, but uh, I would be you know, pretty surprised if it didn't happen within the next few centuries. Um, and what's the probability if it did happen that we wouldn't survive? Um, I'm not sure. Um, but if you multiply those two things together, you get the uh, existential risk due to this thing. Um, and uh, uh, you can see for yourself if you put numbers on those to see whether you end up with a, a ballpark number which is greater than 1% or less than 1%. Uh, uh, but for me, it would be greater than 1% just from the AI risk um, alone. Uh, so uh, some people uh, have uh, tried to make estimates of uh, anth anthropogenic extinction risk. Uh, Martin Rees, who we have here in the audience, um, uh, estimated a 50% chance of anthropogenic extinction uh, over the 20th century. Um, maybe it's a little bit unfair because uh, 15 years have elapsed to so be slightly smaller now or something, but uh, something in that ballpark. Um, uh, at a conference that we had in Oxford, um, uh, launching really the, the study of global catastrophic risks, uh, there was a survey done um, with a lot of questions, one of which was about the aggregate amount of existential risk uh, in the, uh, again, before 2100. Uh, and the median estimate by the researchers at that conference was 19%, most of which was anthropogenic. We sadly didn't ask for a direct break, breakdown, um, but it would, it, you know, not much of it was natural. Um, uh, you might expect that one to be a bit upwardly biased, perhaps, because the type of people who attend conferences on global catastrophic risk might be the type of people who think that it's more likely. Others, you know, they'll be selected for that to some degree. And obviously, if you think it's really unlikely, you wouldn't turn up. So there's at least some selection pressure there. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't think it's an unreasonable guess, though, myself. Um, although I, maybe I'm also selected for that, so uh, you bear that in mind. Uh, the Stern Review, uh, a reasonably sober document uh, produced uh, uh, in this country um, by Lord Stern, uh, had a uh, extinction rate built into it of 0.1% per year, uh, which ends up being approximately 10% per century. Uh, as as you know, the Treasury's view on uh, uh, extinction rate, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. It's actually really quite high. <laughs> it's a bit surprisingly high, uh, given that the uh, Treasury don't actually take extinction all that seriously. You know, they don't spend much money on avoiding it, but they, they put it in here as 0.1% per year. I, I hope that they will, in the future, at least mesh those things together a bit better. Uh, but there are, there, there are a few estimates that I've found. There aren't many people who have estimates on this. Uh, compared to natural risks, all of these are more than 10 times my conservative 1% uh, bound, or more than 100 times my more realistic 0.1% bound. Um, uh, so you could ask here, um, uh, would it be plausible to have estimates of this anthropogenic risk below 0.1%? If not, then it seems that we've now got a pretty nice argument that the anthropogenic ones are more likely than the natural ones. Um, one way of uh, paraphrasing that question is, would we expect to be able to get through uh, a thousand centuries like this one um, before we went extinct uh, from, uh, from anthropogenic <coughs> uh, causes? Um, uh, I, I would like to think that we could, <laughs> but uh, sadly, I'm, uh, 
uh, not that optimistic, uh, but you can, you can kind of try to come up with your own judgments. So a couple of uh, points here to make before I finish. Uh, one is about limitations of this argument. Uh, so one is that, as I said earlier, the bounds for natural risks don't apply to pandemics. Human social systems and technology exacerbate them, so the risk might be increasing over time. Um, and so they're in this intermediate category. So I'm setting them aside, um, which is a bit of a dodge because the talk did say natural versus anthropogenic, so at least you, know, the, you can bear that in mind. Um, uh, also, the arguments are based on averages. Uh, so uh, it, the argument would fail if we happen to know that we're at a time with much higher natural risks. For example, if we spotted a 10 kilometer asteroid uh, on a collision course with the Earth, uh, you couldn't just say, well, it's okay because of this argument. Um, then you would know you're in a time of you know, unusually high risk. Uh, now, I don't know of any serious examples like that at the moment uh, to do with natural risks. Uh, there might be some serious examples for anthrop anthropogenic risks as to why we're at unusually risky time, uh, but it seems like not with the natural risks. Uh, and then a very natural question that comes up is, uh, does this mean we should focus on anthropogenic risks uh, if we're worried about uh, extinction uh, rather than focusing on natural risks? Um, you, you might think that obviously the answer is yes <laughs> because of this talk, but it's actually not, not that obvious. Uh, so being more probable doesn't guarantee it's more tractable. Uh, what we really care about uh, is the absolute risk reduction uh, per unit effort. So for example, if you spend your career on it, uh, will, you know, so if you spend your career on natural risks, will you reduce the extinction risk by more percentage points than if you spend your career on, uh, on anthropogenic risks or not? Um, that's what you really want to know. And it's possible to have something where there's a higher risk, but it's actually very hard to do anything about it. <coughs> now, I think it's um, that there's uh, at least a fairly natural consideration, though, that in general, uh, more probable risks, um, it's easier to do more about them. Uh, so if you imagine how hard it would be to reduce a 5% risk of extinction to a 4.9% risk of extinction versus reducing a 0.2% risk to a 0.1% risk, so halving it, uh, my guess is it would be easier to do the first thing. Uh, that it, there's a kind of diminishing marginal returns type thing that can kick in when you're trying to get rid of the last amount of risk, uh, and that that could be quite difficult. Um, so that could be some reason, uh, therefore, why, you know, why it is that the bigger risk does mean it's more tractable. Uh, I, it certainly means there's more to do, like if you have a larger margin. If you ask, what can we do with 10,000 careers you know, working on this stuff? Well, with the natural risk, the most we could do is get it from whatever it is now to zero, and that's not all that much. I think actually we could probably do more on the anthropogenic risk at a larger margin like that as well. So I guess I didn't put that in here, but that's another point. Um, also, we know that anthropogenic risks have some tractability, um, as opposed to the natural risks, where it's a bit less clear. Uh, it's not that clear what to do about a supervolcanic eruption. Um, but with nuclear war, I mean, we know how to stop nuclear war if we all were willing to do the policy, which is you just don't launch the nuclear weapons. Uh, if no one launched them, there'd be no nuclear war. So at least we know that if you could get um, uh, 195 people, uh, the leaders of the different countries, or maybe I think there's only about 20 nuclear powers, uh, so if you just get those 20 people uh, to not launch nuclear weapons, uh, then uh, you don't have nuclear wars. Uh, that's, that's a lot harder to do than, you know, than just saying it. Uh, but at least we know that it is somewhat tractable. It's a, it's a social coordination, political coordination problem um, uh, that one could work on, as well as potentially technical issues. Um, the same can't be said for most natural risks. Um, uh, and uh, so what we want to think about is which is more tractable on a kind of margin, probably of like if you had an extra research team or an extra million dollars of funding or an extra motivated <coughs> government trying to think more seriously about this, uh, which one would they be better off focusing on? And my, my feeling is the anthropogenic risks. So I can't really see much good reason why the natural risks would win that. Oh, sorry. Ah, I managed to skip my, through my conclusions there. Uh, but uh, basically, I, I remember them. Uh, the conclusions are uh, that uh, we looked at the natural <coughs> risks. Uh, I said that uh, it really seems that, that there's pretty good arguments that they're bounded by 1%. They couldn't be more than 1% per century, or we wouldn't be able to explain why we've been here so long. Um, and it's actually pretty hard to see why they'd be more than about a third of a percent. The anthropogenic risks, though, look like they'd be uh, uh, quite a lot larger than that, um, probably larger than 1%. I can't, I, I, I'm not quite sure how you'd come to the judgment they're less than that per century, but, uh, uh, but I don't want to just tell you what to think on that. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, if we were to go extinct in the next few centuries, uh, it seems that we have reason to think that uh, we would go extinct 
uh, via the anthropogenic risks. Uh, the argument, though, doesn't actually capture the full long term. Um, if we go extinct in, in 10 centuries, 100 centuries time, maybe by that point we will have got the anthropogenic risks very small as well. Um, uh, and we can talk about that a bit in discussion as to what are the prospects of doing that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Toby, for the fascinating talk. We've now got about 20, 25 minutes or so for discussion. Uh, I, I'll, I'll make a cue. Um, please put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Alexander first, and then Alice. All right, so, thanks for You started by saying that it would be a pretty bad thing. Uh, we all mm -hmm. That's a pretty um, sensible to start out with, but I'm just wondering um, if someone were to press you like that, what would you, what, what other theoretical underpinnings were? I mean, there is the view that, um, you know, badness and goodness and it tends to be for people, and something can be bad for somebody or good for somebody, but once it was gone, it was only there for something to be bad for. Um, so I wonder, if, you know, what's the ethical theory? What would you say? So, I mean, I guess there's a, there's a few, few different angles you can take on this. So th there are several different arguments you could run to say that it'd be good if we went extinct. Um, most of those arguments uh, have the conclusion that it's also good when individuals die. Um, uh, so if you have an environmentalist argument about this, uh, that the Earth would be better without humans, it also tends to imply it'd be better with one fewer human as well. Um, and that uh, otherwise there's some kind of discontinuity in the argument that's quite difficult to explain. Uh, and that... Uh, um, that therefore, you know, the NHS is a much worse healthcare system than uh, the US healthcare system because it saves more lives, uh, and you know, you end up with a whole lot of really perverse kind of conclusions coming out and so on, which don't fit how anyone actually thinks about their lives or how we act in any normal day-to-day -day things. So it'd be quite, you know, suspicious of reasoning that that was so at odds with you know everything we think about whether murderers should go to jail or be given medals or something. Um, the view that that if no one were still around. Uh, that at least avoids that problem. Uh, I guess it's interesting. I've, I've never heard it taken seriously in, in philosophy uh, as a view. Um, so I don't know what the standard uh, kind of arguments are about it. Um, I, it does, it, it certainly doesn't seem very plausible to me as a view. <laughs> um, one, one thing that, uh, that I think though is quite useful to say about this and about perhaps a wider selection as well. Um, so, it seems, so suppose we, we give some weight to that idea. We think there's some chance that it wouldn't matter if humans went extinct, but there's also a pretty reasonable chance that it would matter. Um, and if it did matter, it seems like it would matter a great deal. Uh, because not only would there be, uh, in these catastrophic cases, would there be seven billion deaths, uh, but there would also be uh, no more kind of art and culture and uh, all other things that we value uh, going forward. Um, and that there, there are potentially thousands more generations, uh, all of which would be extinguished as well of, of humanity. So it seemed like it'd be very bad if it is bad at all. Um, uh, and so one would want to hedge against this a bit. Uh, and it seems that uh, uh, one of the areas that I've looked at quite a bit is moral uncertainty, which is what to do if you're uncertain about uh, ethical theories. Uh, and uh, I think in this type of case, it's a good example of it, where you'd want to do some hedging, <laughs> because uh, you have some credence in a view which says it would be incredibly bad, and some credence in a view that says, oh, maybe it's not that bad. And uh, you probably want to at least uh, put some weight on it being very bad. Just for the record, I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a relief. <laughs> um, my question was uh, very similar to mm -hmm. that one, so it's, it's probably already covered. motivation for doing any research at all on, on human extinction if it's going to happen uh, according to your prediction um, in, like, in the distant future. Oh, okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, so what I was suggesting is that there's a uh, uh, some kind of chance, like that, I would guess, you know, s somewhere uh, in the ballpark of 10% chance that it's going to happen this century. Uh -huh. uh, and. Um, uh, so we're saying that, that it could be that the, the risk gets a lot lower than 10% if you go enough centuries in the future because we actually get our act together. Um, uh, but at the moment, I would think it's something like that. So uh, that's actually pretty high. Uh, and one consequence of that view is that I therefore think that 
there's maybe not a 10% chance that the people in this room will be uh, killed in some event that it leads to our extinction, but it has to actually be somewhere in that ballpark, like maybe a 5% chance that, you know, for each of us that we'll die from this. Um, so, so it's actually, uh, some of the stuff's, you know, pretty soon. <laughs> Uh, and this is, this is not that unusual of you. It's a bit unusual, I guess, for our generation to think about this, but the people here who are a bit older than us uh, and who lived through the Cold War, um, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking very seriously about double-digit percentage chances of uh, dying in a, in a uh, you know, massive global catastrophe that was possibly the end of humanity. Uh, and uh, so I think, I think we should be somewhat worried about it ourselves, uh, but I'm actually mainly worried on an kind of ethical angle uh, because I'm worried about other people. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, even if they live in the future as well. Uh, then may I answer the other question that we should, we should care because it will be worse for us as individuals? Uh, I guess that, that could be right. I mean, if you've got this kind of view that where does the badness happen if there's no people around at the time, uh, maybe the badness happens before that time because there's people at this time who make judgments about that time. Um, I'm not really sure. It, no one explores these views, so I, I think that's because they, <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> but I, I don't know, uh, I'm not very familiar with them. <laughs> Okay. Nick yep. Well, this is not even quite a person affecting one in this case because it's to, it's more it's kind of meta ethical as well. So, but, but but thanks. Okay, I, I've got a, a long list Sorry. of people now. I've got about eight people, so I want to okay, I'll try to look at and I can see some more hands. I, I just want to encourage you to be brief if possible, please. You by the door. Go the next. Sure. Um, I was curious if you'd seen any research on this infrastructure, so electrical infrastructure. Um, so a large coronal mass ejection or um, cyber security risks, and if those kinds of risks are sort of at the level that you would consider to be on par with the sorts of risks you're talking about here. So I haven't looked into either of those things in all that much detail. Um, I know that the UK government's very worried about uh, space weather, I think is their term for it. Um, uh, and I think Carrington type event is like the standard term for it. A big, event which would uh, uh, basically wipe out a whole lot of um, electronic equipment for a long period of time, including generators, um, and, and which includes basically all communication systems in the UK between different settlements and things. I guess you could drive cars potentially if the cars don't have electronic starters. Uh, it's, uh, it's not really, uh, I haven't looked into this, it doesn't sound very good. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, it sounds a lot less bad than the nuclear winter scenario to me, but um, I, I don't know the details on how long it would take to get things started again. There, every now and then you get a report about this, like there's a report saying in the US that it would, an event like this would kill 30% of the population or something, which uh, I thought sounded like too high, but, but that's, that's just based on my intuition really, rather than, you know, I'm not an expert in those events. Uh, they're definitely something that someone should look at. <laughs> Chris. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask about the um, natural anthropogenic mm -hmm. distinction a little bit. So you acknowledge that there was some fuzziness in that distinction when you yeah. talked about pandemics. One thing you didn't talk about that I thought might kind of more thoroughly undermine the distinction mm -hmm. or put pressure on it was human population. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that in some sense uh, human progression is a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it's also at the heart of uh, many of the anthropogenic risks that you yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, I, I so as population as a driver for increasing the probability of anthropogenic risks, uh, I would kind of count on the anthropogenic side of things. Um, so I'd be thinking, I guess, uh, in this case, more of uh, what are the what are the types of events that happen, um, such as a nuclear war, rather than what are the risk factors that increase them, uh, such as over overpopulation potentially or political strife or something like that um, uh, but so I would I would kind of lump all of those things in on the anthropogenic side um, just because overpopulation on, in its own isn't an extinction thing it's, a, it's the opposite um, uh, so yeah uh, but thanks um, you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my views with this, uh, is, is with this risk associated with AI it seems to be stuck in the uh, terminator mode, mm -hmm. um, whereas what we've seen is an exponential rise in the size of networks mm -hmm. and the near ubiquity of access points to it, and it watches mm -hmm. mobile phone. Um, there's talk of, um, in some quarters, that parts of Google having a subconscious, 
um, acting like the subconscious, not the conscious. Mm -hmm. If these networks uh, become more conscious, then obviously they're going to be more compatible than they are now. And, and dismissing them as a technical or anthropological threat is, is a bit uh, strange because no, one, no government seems to be able to stop them. We can't stop them. No one can stop them. Now, if, if they do become more compatible and take more of our intelligence away from us, um, and the possibility in 200 years' time we wake up one day and we don't wake up one day because we, we are part of a, a, some, um, uh, if you like, we've evolved into insects. If that is an evolutionary step, is it considered as extinction if we become something else? Okay, so there's a lot of things going on there uh, in, in, in to, do with, to do with the, uh, uh, like, questions about, you know, particular pathways and also the overall question. So. Uh, the, I, you know, I don't find the particular pathways very likely, or I, I would need to know a lot more about why you'd be worried about, you know, the, the consciousness and various questions there. However, the, I think in terms of the overall thing is 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 like really quite interesting, uh, which is uh, how important, uh, you know, would it count as extinction if we were replaced with something else? Uh, what I, I mean, I don't really know for the purposes of talking about extinction. Uh, I often talk about existential risk, uh, which is defined as uh, uh, irrevocably losing almost all value uh, or a similar definition. And if you're using a definition like that, then if, if the things that succeed us, um, uh, if, if they have value, um, uh, you know, like our children have value, uh, uh, and even if our children are smarter than us or wiser than us, they still you know, have potentially even more value, uh, as opposed to uh, perhaps insects and maybe sounds a bit less plausible to have a lot of value. Um, uh, so that would say that it's an existential risk if we're replaced by something that, uh, that is less valuable. And then you need to get into the kind of moral philosophy as to what we're talking about there. Um, uh, as to whether it's an extinction risk, uh, probably is extinction if we're kind of replaced by something that, that isn't, we wouldn't call homo sapiens. Uh, but maybe it would be a case of extinction without it being bad um, if it's uh, if, in the same way that you know, we lead to new generations, and we generally think that so that's not so bad. So, uh, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> Difficult to get onto everything there, but I hope I've done said enough. Nick, um, it's related to that question. You just said it was now extinction would would be important extinction if we didn't have any Homo sapiens surviving us. But you also said earlier that Homo erectus became extinct. Mm -hmm. Homo erectus transformed into mm -hmm. the modern human beings. Neanderthals, on the other hand, really went extinct. It didn't quite because five percent of our genes got passed over by crossbreeding humans. Probably means that in this room there's probably about ten Neanderthals. Don't get trying to put numbers as you're doing this. You've got a much clearer idea about what biological species were extinction would amount to. Um, and but and therefore you've you, you, you kind of bounded around the you're using the same argument about different things, it seems to me, and it doesn't really add up. It's all important also in relation to the um, question of the that Martin Meeson is to argue that, of course, the descendants of human beings will not be homo sapiens biologically, um, but nonetheless, they will be creatures which have been informed by our values and our, and our intelligence and everything else, and that we ought to be proud of that rather than, than, than being frightened of it in the long run. I mean, the important thing is to make quite certain that we do have descendants which aren't like Homo sapiens, because Homo sapiens couldn't survive any death of the universe. Okay, so uh, again, there's uh, quite a lot of things there, particularly that last bit, uh, because I'm, I'm not sure that we'll be able to solve that one, uh, even, even no matter what we, uh, we uh, replace ourselves with. Uh, but in terms of the question about uh, different kind of senses of extinction, whether that's muddled, got muddled and then kind of made the argument not, not work or have holes in it which we'd need to go and investigate, I don't think it does, uh, because uh, there are several different ways a species can go extinct. And I tried to flag this at the start. Uh, and one of them is, say, being slowly outcompeted. Another one is like basically turning into something else. So that there's, we would say, you know, biologists would say that species is no longer around, but now there is a new species, and that species descended from the original one. Um, but it seems like uh, I'm mainly interested in catastrophic uh, extinction. Uh, and the, the natural extinctions are a uh, kind of a broader category than catastrophic natural extinctions, which are a subcategory. Um, and so since I'm mainly trying to calculate upper bounds for those things uh, in order to use, uh, to compare to the, uh, the anthropogenic ones, um, uh, they should still work as upper bounds. Um, 
So uh, when we look at the, the record, you know, these are the kinds of numbers that you get with all forms of extinction. Um, and so the probability per century would be even smaller if we looked at uh, a catastrophic extinction, which is what we want to then compare with catastrophic anthropogenic extinction. So I think that bit still does work. Um, you sir, with the dark tech. Um, I'm just, we, we obviously divide um, the various possibilities, as you were trying to suggest, into uh, natural versus anthropogenic. And so there's any value in perhaps integrating those two causes sometimes, because um, some of the examples you gave particularly with regards to nuclear war, mm -hmm. seem to be a combination of the two. For instance, uh, the sun is blaring off the clouds and it's close to misinterpretation. More obvious examples of something that could go wrong and spark a nuclear war might be something like the uh, Chelyabinsk, uh, the Chelyabinsk, a uh, small asteroid exploded mm -hmm. and had the force of something like four kilotons perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, once every century or so, you might get a really big explosion. There was one in Siberia, which was mm -hmm. equal to maybe 10 megatons. Mm -hmm. It's something like that in the city during the Cold War, a very easy as far from nuclear war. But obviously, the cause isn't purely anthropogenic because if you have had an impact, the cold the nuclear war which resulted as a reaction to it wouldn't have happened. So, if you're making estimates about uh, what's likely to happen with an asteroid wiping all humanity, well, it's very low. But if you have nuclear weapons. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting case. Um, yeah, I certainly hadn't thought about a case like just like that one there. I mean, uh, I, I can certainly imagine people being a bit puzzled as to whether that was a, uh, is it, you know, it certainly required the natural event, um, and it required both actually in the case you just mentioned. So, um, uh, however, the, the reason I'm using the categories is not so much to make a kind of interesting philosophical statement about anthropogenic versus natural risks, which I think would get, you know, your, your comment would hurt that if I was trying to do that. Instead, I'm trying to say, is it the kind of thing that we should be more worried about? Uh, people building, you know, new technologies uh, such as uh, artificial intelligence or nuclear weapons or things like that, or is the kind of thing we should be worried about working out how to deflect asteroids and track them and uh, work out how to deal with supervolcanoes and things like that, um, uh, where the focus is on the, all the things I named are potential existential risks, um, whereas it could be, for example, that occasionally you get a lightning strike. Um, which and a lightning strike at a nuclear facility, you know, or something could could lead to some false start. Uh, but lightning strikes weren't the kind of thing I was trying to put into either category in the first place. Uh, I think that what I would say there is, I guess, preventing lightning strikes would have helped. Uh, but the the main thing that was really needed to get the extinction to happen is uh, is uh, the nuclear war. So I think that for what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm okay with these categories, and, or at least just, even if I didn't give them names, I just told you the things in each one <laughs> to let you get the, the feel of it. But you're right, that uh, if one ever tries to come up with a really clear philosophical distinction between natural and anthropogenic, you're normally doomed, uh, you just can't get it to work. So uh, I think I kind of squeak through here because I'm not trying to put much weight on the distinction. But, uh, but thanks. Um, yeah, so thank you for your talk. Um, I'm interested in the uh, But the AI 
impact destroyed civilizations that are negative and bad, back to that point about immoral civilizations. So in fact, they might be mildly destroying all the bad in the world and leaving us with the good in the world. And the good, of course, is what we have all forced, well, you know, millennia, been uh, focused on increasing and driving. So in fact, the net net might be, from the perspective, that we're improving the world with these things rather than Okay, so, so, so I think the, the only bit of my talk that technically uh, really talked about this was the bit where I said, the first line, I think, where I said that uh, it's uh, uh, pretty much the worst thing that could happen. Um, uh, everything else was really actually just uh, trying to quantify how likely it is, um, rather than saying whether it was good or bad. Um, it would kind of take it as tacit uh, that you know, most people think it's, it's bad. Um, and you're right that, uh, that not everyone has a kind of universal view that everyone's equally valuable, or even if they, they say that everyone's equally valuable, they don't act as if that's, that's quite the case. Uh, there are also some potentially people who think that, uh, that other groups of negative value. Um, uh, I think they're probably generally wrong about that. <laughs> um, uh, th so there are definitely people out there who have views that are just bad views, and I'm not going to like, worry so much about like, whether I would be you know, taken as being correct by them. Uh, but it sounded like it was actually getting into some stuff that the first couple of questions were about to do with what if you just had the, you know, just got rid of these humans and just went back to having daffodils and trees and things like that and some, you know, some rhinoceroses and things. Uh, would that be better? Um, well, I would just be clear with saying that, like, but more that, the, that the, there are small pockets of people who, you know, like okay. many moments in our history have viewed the destruction of other people as a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess, I guess that fits in with my point about Elm Shinrico and other groups where I said who who would you know be uh, nasty enough to actually want to uh, do the engineered pathogens. Uh, um, so uh, uh, you know, there are some people who would. And, uh, and remember, though, we are the product of that. So we are the we we are the result of those victors. Who have destroyed many others, including the I think we might move on because I, 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 I think we have time for two more okay. questions. In the very briefly, um, just on this in the first question, this uh, invitation uh, to say, uh, I heard this right that at some point in the talk, you seem to have sub, sub uh, to say something like probably Homo sapiens wasn't a good thing on the whole so far for the planet or something. And I just, just a little bit more about your background. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's a little bit glib. Um, uh, yeah, I was, I was, what I was trying to say was that, um, that there's no doubting that, uh, that these days that Homo sapiens uh, is actually having a very, uh, if not the dominant species, uh, some people argue that the various forms of bacteria would be dominant species, so uh, it's uh, quite a good argument on that grounds, but it's at least a, a dominant species that's clearly having massive impacts of various forms. Um, uh, moving more kind of minerals around than any other species doing, you know, at, at all kinds of levels, um, uh, having huge effects on the world. Uh, so all I was really trying to say uh, was that uh, we're able to have this remarkable kind of position uh, because of our intelligence and using that as an argument that if we therefore were to create something that had even more of this intelligence than us, uh, that the one way in which we're unique, which t turns out to be the one way in which we're able to have so much control about the world, uh, would no longer make it be unique in that way, which to show that there's you know, natural reason to think that we could be in a bit of trouble at that point. Um, I, uh, I don't really know about what I think about humanity's effects so far. Uh, we've certainly done a lot of bad stuff. I think that a lot of our lives though have been worth living, so that's been good. Uh, I definitely am very positive, though, about humanity for the future. I think that uh, there's been a, a huge amount of moral progress over time, uh, and I think that that, that will continue, uh, and, uh, and I think we'll be able to do a lot of good things in the future. Um, so, uh, so it was more that I don't, I don't rely upon claims that we've done good things in the past in order to get the claims that I want. Okay, now I think we'll make this the last question. Uh, I just would like to know how we can balance uh, progress and existential risk how can mm -hmm. we make sure that the scientists are going to work on the uh, HIV treatment and not the terrible virus we talked mm -hmm. about? Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, this is something, I, I think that if, if humanity was serious about this stuff, um, I think that we would want to make uh, avoiding existential risk um, a kind of iron commitment, uh, you know, that we were not going to break. Uh, so we would do a lot of other things within that framework. Uh, 
if, if it's the case that we thought that we could uh, cure HIV one year earlier, but we would, that would uh, have an appreciable impact on not having any future generations at all, um, and having you know, everyone in this generation be killed, um, that, that would be a pretty bad idea. Uh, so I think that uh, in a lot of cases, we'd want to go quite a bit slower than we're going at the moment. Um, and we might want to develop uh, better systems for regulating uh, such research. Uh, so uh, that's not to say that we should look at our current regulatory tools and just slap on a whole lot of them on this research. Uh, that might be a bad move. Um, uh, uh, but we need to think more seriously about how to get various forms of good regulation to work, including self-regulation and so on uh, with some of these things. Uh, ideally, uh, you know, a lot of the people in these uh, scientific and technological fields will take this stuff seriously. Uh, in AI, uh, you know, there's good news on that. It seems that people uh, at the forefront of this are actually taking these risks uh, very seriously now. Uh, uh, you know, some of the people at the forefront you know, taking it extremely seriously and trying to be very careful. Uh, so I think that there's you know, some hope for optimism there. Uh, but it, I think that if it were the case that, that all centuries were going to have the kind of risk profile of the 21st century, uh, or, the, or even the 20th century, uh, then we're not going to be getting many more centuries in expecta expectation. Um, uh, I think that we need to, to bring that number down, uh, you know, the risk per century, and I, I think that we'll be able to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, not with 100% probability. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're out of time. Apologies to the people who didn't get to ask that question. But please, all of you, um, uh, do feel very welcome to join us for uh, a drink over a crash in the Alison Richards building just to the north of here. Um, but before we do that, please join me in thanking Toby for the little <laughs>